Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. I'm Dr. Sammy Buzzard, I'm a climate scientist, and the most unexpected thing maths has led me to is learning to shoot a rifle in Svalbard in the Arctic. Well, we need to know more about this. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, so you're a mathematician working in climate science. Yeah. And you know how to shoot a rifle. <laughs> yeah, so this is not most of my day job, I should clarify <laughs> that. A lot of the time I spend kind of coding on my laptop and solving mathematical equations. But the reason I'm looking at those equations is to work out how fast the ice is melting in the Arctic and the Antarctic. So that led me to then be up in the Arctic and taking some field measurements. But part of that is you do have to learn to defend yourself from polar bears while you're up there. Wow, and this is just anyone doing field work in the Arctic basically has to go through this training? Yeah, essentially. Um, so, Svalbard, the kind of island up in the Arctic that I went to, it has a town there called Longyearbyen, it's about 3,000 people. So you can walk around the town without a rifle, but as soon as you leave the boundaries of the town, you have to have at least like one rifle per however many people. Wow. Um, it's the, yeah, the polar bears are a known danger there. Mm. And of course, you're not actually wanting to shoot the polar bears. We should clarify this for everybody. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. It's like a it's, it's like a last resort. Is that correct? It's sort of. Yeah. So we're very much aware that when we're going out there to shoot science, we're going into the polar bears' habitat. This is their home, yeah. and part of the reason why they are kind of going around the towns and coming near humans is because lots of the sea ice in the Arctic has melted, and they're pretty hungry, and that's our fault. So we definitely shouldn't be putting them in any danger at all. So the governor on Svalbard is actually very good at kind of knowing a lot of the times where polar bears are and mm. work, um, warning people if they get too near the town, for example. Um, but if um, they're kind of sneaky and they're the same color as the snow, so <laughs> occasionally there is a small danger, you will find one in an unexpected place. Um, but we take all sorts of things with us. So when I was there, we kind of had a pistol that could make like a loud noise or mm. you can have like a flare or something that will disturb them more. I've heard it's also good to just throw your gloves at them because there'll be something that's interesting and smells strange and they'll like be curious about that and then you can back off and like get off in the other direction. So yeah, anything you can do to not hurt them, but they are also an incredibly dangerous predator. So you do have to have that very, very last resort if it's you or them, then yeah. I don't know. I'm still not sure I could do that. <laughs> I did say that to my colleagues one day after it had been my day holding the rifle. I was like, yeah, but I mean, they're endangered. And like, am I that important? And they're like, okay, you can not, you're not carrying the rifle tomorrow. <laughs> and how did you end up in Svalbard specifically? So you mentioned you study ice sheets and, and various things. So, so basically, did sounds like that took you to the Arctic and to Svalbard. Yeah, so because I'm a mathematician, a lot of the stuff I do is modelling and there are other people who are much better at kind of going into the field and taking measurements. But it's not like when you're in one of those boxes, you're only in that box. So lots of people who are good at fieldwork do a bit of modelling and those of us that do a lot of the math side of things need to see some ice occasionally. It's really important to know what the field workers do and actually see some of the processes that you're trying to model because... It's kind of a bit of common sense if knowing if your models are saying the right thing. If you've actually seen it, then you know you have a good idea if that's like a reasonable amount of ice or speed or that kind of thing. Mm. Um, so I was up there. It was actually part of a training course run by the British Antarctic Survey who took a group of students up to Svalbard. We went up to New Orleans, which is the most northern civilian town in the world. Um, it's not really a town. It's essentially just a collection of research bases. <laughs> Um, with the world's most northern post office, which is very important when you go there to send a postcard from that. Um, but yeah, they took people whose careers have ended up being a lot in field work and those who've gone more down the modelling route. But then from that, we kind of, we know more about, a lot about what each other do and can form really good collaborations from that side as well. So it was really nice that they didn't just say, this is about planning field work for field workers. They took some of the modellers as well. Mm. So now, if I do get the opportunity to go into the field, because it's not something that I'm against doing, for sure, like, my strengths are definitely in the math side, but it's also important to go sometimes, so when those chances do come up, I'm prepared to go, and I won't be, like, mm. the mathematician that's dropping everything and, like, falling <laughs> over on the ice. I do actually know what I'm doing in the yeah. outdoors. So. No, it's interesting you mentioned, like, um, having the opportunity to do these things. Mm. So 
when I was doing my PhD, even though I was studying rivers and oceans, the opportunity came up for me to join an expedition to go to the Southern Ocean. Nice. To actually sail That's around amazing. Antarctica for six weeks. And similar to, like you say, we had to do training, sort of like life-saving training. We had to do like a whole day where I had to wear a big suit and then jump off like a five meter oh, platform. Oh yes, I've done that one. Into the wave yeah. pool and all that. that was... <laughs> Did you have to do the one where you had to flip the life raft and everything? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just, it's crazy, isn't it? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my housemate at the time nearly like elbowed me. They always had to like. <laughs> I was going to yeah. get a concussion from the pool, but that was really fun. I'm not big on heights, but by the end, because we were jumping off this really high platform, and the instructor was like, "Oh, you just want to have one more go for fun?" I was like, "Yes, that's great." <laughs> so yeah, right. that was good, but also yeah, pretty scary. Yeah, no, I, I felt totally fine with it all until they were like, "Right, we're going to turn the lights off. We're going to mm -hmm. get the wave pool going fully. Yeah. There's going to be like showers coming from the ceiling." It was like, a, I felt like I was in a storm yeah. and then it was like, and, and there was like flashes and it was like, right, now you've got to jump in, right the life raft. And like, it was, yeah, it was, again, not, not quite as cool as shooting a rifle, but mm -hmm. <laughs> just something else that it sounds like you did it as well, that I just had no idea I would end up doing as a mathematician. If this video has you thinking about ways to reduce your impact on the environment, then look no further as Skillshare has got you covered. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who loves learning and wants to explore their creativity and learn new skills. I found the sustainable living class from Catherine Kellogg particularly helpful. As the author of 101 Ways to Go Zero Waste and the spokesperson for Plastic Free Living for National Geographic, Catherine has bags of experience and know-how when it comes to actionable tips and hand-picked resources to help you to reduce your impact on the environment. The first 1,000 people to join using the link in the video description or the code on screen will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare, which includes access to the Sustainable Living course. So why not give it a go and see how you can make choices that add up to a positive impact for yourself, your community, and your planet. Tell me more about your actual research then. Okay, so I, funny enough, look at the other <laughs> end of the planet, <laughs> um, but it's all ice, so a lot of it overlaps, but most of my work is focused on Antarctica. So most of what you can see in Antarctica is actually land covered in ice. So the Arctic's the opposite. The Arctic's an ocean covered mm -hmm. in frozen ice. And not everyone realises that if you go to the North Pole and drill down, there's going to be ocean below your feet. You wouldn't have to actually. It's in probably only a couple of metres thick, the ice there. But the ice on Antarctica is really thick, and below that, there's land. But because the ice flows on Antarctica, and it flows really slowly, but it does flow in the same way that glaciers do, you get parts of the ice that, when it reaches the edge of the land, it just carries on flowing, so it gets to the ocean, but it floats on top of the ocean. And these are what we call ice shelves. And that's what I research because they're really important in terms of climate change because they're floating on the ocean, they're affected from underneath by changes in the ocean, yep. but they also are also affected by changes in the atmosphere. So it's kind of like a two-pronged attack. So mm. they're the part of Antarctica that's changing fastest. I see, I see. And when you're talking about ice shelves, I immediately think of ice shelves melting, yep. and obviously with, with the various issues we have with the climate. So is is that kind of what you're trying to understand? Yeah, so I deal with one of the prongs of the two prongs because okay. lo looking at the ocean and what's happened on the base of the ice shelf is a whole field of research in itself yeah. and loads of people are doing that. But there are also some of this who want to know what's going on on top of the ice shelf as well. And the thing that I really care about is how fast it's melting and where that water's going because you find in some areas of Antarctica, especially kind of this sticky out bit here, the peninsula, mm -hmm. because that's... Um, northern, but less southern. It seems weird to call it northern <laughs> when it's like on the bottom of the planet. Yeah. But um, that's maybe one of the areas of Antarctica that's kind of changing the fastest. Mm. It's slightly warmer than some of the more southern areas. So this means you get a lot of melting on the surface of the ice shelf. And the water will then accumulate to form these lakes. And some ice shelves have been absolutely covered in them. So there's one at the moment, George the Sixth ice shelf, that I've been doing some research on that's you can see when you look at satellite images of it, there are these like, really bright blue features. So they're like several mm. metres deep and often up to kilometres across. And they're important, not only because they're a different colour to the surrounding ice shelf, so because they're darker, they absorb more energy from the sun, mm -hmm. they heat up, cause more melting, and it's kind of a feedback that it's bad. Yeah. But also, when you have crevasses in the ice shelf, so these big cracks kind of already exist in the ice shelf, but if you fill one up with water, 
then the pressure of the water kind of presses on those crevasses and it might cause them to kind of open further and potentially cause the dramatic ice shelf collapse. So knowing where that water is forming and where it's going to, where it's moving across the ice shelf is the focus of my work to try and work out if it's getting to those areas of the ice shelf that are maybe really crevassed and are vulnerable to sudden collapse. You also mentioned um, collapse ice shelves. Now, I can sort of recall several instances of this being discussed in the news in recent times, and I think maybe 10, 20 years ago, yeah. there was a big one. Um, so are those kinds of, are they the events you are working on, basically? Yeah, so I think the one you're talking about is probably the last and B I shelf was in 2002. So that was certainly the first time I remember seeing something from the polar regions in the headlines. And I think it was on the front page of like the Wall Street Journal or like a major yeah. US newspaper anyway, um, these sudden satellite images of this ice shelf just collapsing because it's the first time we'd really seen anything like that and it happened so quickly. It's kind of just within a few weeks the ice shelf was there and then loads of it wasn't and it was big. Um, whenever people talk about this they say it's the size of Rhode Island which is not helpful actually if you're not <laughs> in the like, US. Well, Rhode <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I've now because I was working in the US the last couple of years and actually drove through Rhode Island was like oh this is actually kind of big but when you look at it on a map it's one of the smallest states you're like is that big I don't know and um, but it's about twice the size of Greater London so okay, it's right. like a huge area of ice you just yep. disappear like that within like a few weeks essentially. And, and when you say disappear is it a case of like so you're talking about this kind of floating, in some sense, floating ice shelf mm -hmm. that's attached, but has water underneath, air above. So is it a case that it kind of cracks and then part of it just kind of falls off? Yeah, that's kind of right. But it, it kind of, in this case anyway, it's not always the case, but this one sort of shattered into really small pieces. I mean, okay. by small, I still mean like meters across at least, or possibly even kilometers. But yeah, it fell into lots of tiny little pieces that then kind of floated off and got mixed up in all the sea ice around Antarctica and eventually disappeared. So it wasn't like yeah. it was just there and it sunk. It was still going to just like float away mm -hmm. in lots okay. of parts. And in, I feel bad for asking this question, mm -hmm. but like, <laughs> why is the shrinking of an ice shelf particularly bad news for the climate, for example? Oh. The ice shelf itself doesn't matter so much in terms of sea level rise, because that's when we mm. think about the polar regions, we're often thinking about sea level rise, how yeah. is it going to impact that? Because the ice shelves are already floating on the water, they've already displaced their own weight in the water. Mm -hmm. um, it's Archimedes' principle, if you remember that from, like, <laughs> I guess, I GCSE indeed. physics. Um, but yeah, so that means the ice shelves don't immediately matter for sea level rise. But why they do matter is because they're around the edges of Antarctica, they're holding all of this back. So when you take away an ice shelf, all the kind of glaciers and the ice that was on the land that was flowing into the ice shelf mm -hmm. is then just flowing straight into the ocean. And the ice shelves provide a force that's stopping that. So you take that away and then those glaciers are free to speed up and you get more water going into the ocean that wasn't there before and you get sea level rise. And that was observed when Larsen B, this big ice shelf collapsed in 2002, the glaciers right. that used to flow onto it were observed to accelerate. So we know that was kind of causing more ice to get into the ocean than was there originally. So in hearing about your work, I think it's fair to say, as a mathematician, you're obviously modeling and using maths to help us understand the climate yeah. and what's happening. How does that feed in to the IPCC report that came out very recently? The IPCC report is um, basically, it brings together all the research. So modelers like me will feed their research into publications and then the IPCC takes all the publications and says, okay, what's the consensus? Um, which is really important because I'm trying to model what these ice sheets and ice shelves are doing, but other people are doing that too, and they might have slightly different answers. And it's the same for the people that are modeling the atmosphere or clouds or heat waves. Um, so the IPCC takes all those things and say, okay, what is the most likely, how confident are we that this is gonna happen? And what do we think is gonna happen in the future? So all the climate scientists essentially do their own kind of little parts and then mm -hmm an overall group will work out what that says when you put all this research together because it's just too much to understand as an individual. Yeah. I, when I read the latest report that came out a couple of weeks ago that most of the ice shelf stuff, there wasn't anything that was 
surprising in there because that's the area that I stay on top of, but I have no idea what's going on with the rest of the climate. So it's a really nice kind of summary. Mm. So if you had to summarise, what is the state of the climate <laughs> at the moment? Um, Other than not good. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most important things about the latest report that came out was they said humans have definitely caused this. Yeah. So IPCC kind of has this strange sort of language where they say something's kind of like a bit likely or very likely and this time they were just like, no, it's humans. Like, <laughs> there's no two ways about it. We have changed the climate, mm -hmm. which, yeah, I mean, it's important to And this to is the first that. one that was that confident. Yeah, I, like, I think the past ones much. have just been like, it's very likely, but okay, this one, yeah, in kind of the press okay. conferences, the lead scientists were just saying, no, we, we have caused this and yeah. there's, yeah, we can't really get around this. Um, how much we've caused and which specific parts we've caused, there are kind of more uncertainties around that, but we know overall we have changed the climate. Mm. In terms of the stuff that I really care about, so the ice shelf part, it was essentially kind of an update on previous estimates of how much sea level rise we're gonna have. So it was kind of going along with what we thought previously, but maybe slightly worse. So the estimates are saying kind of up to the end of this century, anything up to a meter of sea level rise is quite feasible. Um, there are some models that predict much more than that, but they weren't certain enough to be included in the report's kind of overall estimate, but they were mentioned in there as well. So. Yeah, not 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 great. No. <laughs> but <laughs> well, what did it give any suggestions of what we can do other than sort of stop producing carbon dioxide? <laughs> well, <laughs> the part that just came out was the physical science part of the IPCC. So okay. there are different groups. So physical science are the ones that just look at how much things are changing and how fast. Okay. But there are other groups that look at, at um, adaptation and mitigation and kind of more of the human impacts of that. So those are reports that we're still waiting to come out. And I they're see. all kind of okay. going through the same process together. So it won't be so long before we have those, but that's right. kind of the, what do we do next and how is this influencing people? So we have, we have our current snapshot. Yeah. And then sort of the next follow-up ones, as you say, we'll then look at, right, well, how is this going to affect things? How can we mitigate yeah. this? How can we, okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the things in terms of sea level rise that I guess is good is a lot of it happens towards the end of the century. So we have time to prepare. We know this okay. is going to happen, but yeah. it's not going to happen tomorrow. So as long as we don't just say, oh, it's not going to happen tomorrow, so we don't have to worry. <laughs> yeah. This is going to happen towards the end of the century, so we need to start thinking about it now because a lot of that we are locked into. It takes Antarctica a really long time to respond to changes. A lot of the changes we're seeing now um, would have been influenced by um, climate change potentially decades in the past. Mm. So the stuff that we're kind of doing now and things that we're putting into the atmosphere now, we're going to see that effect on Antarctica in a long time. And even if we stopped emitting any greenhouse gases now, we're still going to get some sea level rise. So yeah. I think, yeah, it's about accepting that it's going to happen. We can't stop it. We can make it much worse, so we definitely yeah, yeah. need to stop doing things that are going to make it worse. But yeah, we also know that a certain amount's going to happen, so we need to do something about it. Before you go, remember to check out the Sustainable Living course on Skillshare for great ideas to help to reduce your impact on the environment. Join using the link in the video description or the code on screen for a one-month free trial. See you next time.